Hello, everybody. Welcome to Healthy Paws. Today, we're talking about my dog has osteoarthritis. What is osteoarthritis? Osteoarthritis is, when we think as humans, we think of arthritis. Everything we hear in the media is about arthritis, arthritis this, arthritis that. But our canines and our felines don't get the same type of arthritis that we get. We think of rheumatoid arthritis for most of when you think of arthritis, you're thinking multi-joints affected at the same time due to some type of immune-mediated mediator going on. So that's where your immune system is attacking your own joints, the cartilage and your ligaments and tendons. But this isn't the case. It does happen with pets and I'm going to say it doesn't happen, but not to the extent with humans. So osteoarthritis is a name that's given to, or we could say degenerative joint disease, may be a better term for this syndrome. So when you're talking about it, are we talking about how's your pet weight? Is your dog overweight? And when we look at that chart and you talk about every additional pound to the dog, it adds four pounds of pressure to their joints. Is this the cause of this? No, but this is one of the predisposing factors. So if we say what could be the causes, let's just choose five causes. So one weight is a big issue. As you said, there was a great study that showed one additional pound equals four additional pounds of shear force through the joint. So we use the example of the overweight Labrador retriever that's 10 pounds overweight. That equates to an additional 40 shear, 40 pounds of shear force. Another reason could be uh, where they are in the growth stage or growth spurt. So if we have a large breed dog like a Great Dane, we know that they grow until they're about two years of age. So if we give them too much nutrition, their bones can't grow at the same rate as their soft tissue. So we now get joint instability. We've all heard the thing, elbow dysplasia and hip dysplasia. Another reason, so reason number, let's say three, is overuse injury. So everyone goes to the park with their beloved pet companion, throws that ball at six back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Well, you get to a point where you can overload the joint and cause degenerative changes in the joint just because of those repetitive activities. For trauma, our beloved pet is hit by a car, suffers some type of traumatic injury that then causes degenerative changes to the joint. So we know that if we break a bone or we fracture a joint, that's going to have implications later on in life. And fifthly, genetics. We know some animals just genetically, if we use my fav- one of my favorite breeds, the British Bulldog. He is really not designed like a greyhound to be sleek and great- graceful and running, but he is built like a tank. And so his joints are designed that way. And every breed has their own, how can we say, unique flavor to how they develop different forms of degenerative joint disease. Is there, is there a time, so you're talking about like if a puppy's growing too quickly, that could affect them if their bones are growing faster than their skin or their skin faster than their joints or their bones. Um, what about older dogs? Is there, is there an age that people should be more aware of what's going on with their dogs and really keep their eye on this area for their dogs? Yes, if we know that if they suffer, if they're genetically predisposed, so we all hear golden retrievers are genetically predisposed to hip dysplasia. So if we know that there's a genetic link for a certain type of joint laxity, then we know to watch them throughout their life. Keep them clean, lean, keep them on nutraceuticals, do physical activity with them. But we also know that I like to treat We know that every one human years in our animals equates to about seven years in dog life. That gets longer for the larger breeds and shorter for the shorter breeds because we know a chihuahua will live 15 to 20 years where a Great Dane may only live seven to nine years. So we then have to look at the breed to work out when they're adults and then from the age of adulthood, then looking to do things to help protect their joints.
I assume that a lot of people don't really look at their dog this way or, you know, they'll see their dog being an older dog and they're like, oh, it's just age. There's nothing we can do about it. What can you do about the health of the dog if they're at this stage and they have this? Well, we're learning more and more with, we now have great technology called PET scans, MRI, CT scans. So we can see the joint and how the joint ages through the lifetime of pets that have been, or animals or control animals that have been studied. So we know when we should start to introduce nutraceutical, pharmaceuticals to help slow down the progression of degenerative joint disease so they have a great golden years than when traditionally, oh, my dog's now starting to limp, it's old now, now we think about doing joint protection. And really, as this research is coming out, we're always bringing that forward. We're starting to do younger and younger dogs. An example is a injection pharmaceutical called Adequin. And so traditionally, I would only start that with my geriatric patients. Then I started it with my older patients. Then I started it with my mature patients. And now I'm injecting it and prescribing it for puppies that have joint issues, either from trauma or from genetic issues because I can see the benefits of this supplement protecting their joints for their life. And then once you get them on these supplements, do they stay on the supplements for the rest of their life? Yeah, they do. St- they stay on the supplements. So we know that if um, your puppy broke their, their leg or blew out their cruciate ligament or did things that encompass a joint, had OCD lesions, so osteochondritis dissecans, so that's a cartilage flap in the elbow or the shoulder that breaks free and we see this in older in large breed dogs because they grow too fast the cartilage can't develop properly it breaks off they're now joints that pre uh, we know that they're going to develop let's say arthritis in layman's terms or degenerative joint disease later on in their life we want to be doing things early on to give them the building blocks to protect those joints and just slow down the severity of the degenerative joint disease will happen later on. I was talking to Podgenics, and it's actually they do DNA testing for dogs and their breeds and the different types of breeds, and they can tell if a dog has certain genetics that get them predisposed opposed to these different elements and all that and you keep saying labradors is there a place that you that people can go to see if their dog's on this chart that it's something that they need to be concerned about so the uh, in america you have the akc the american kennel club in britain you have the british kennel club in australia you have the australian kennel club and they will have breed standard tables for different breeds, purebreds, what to expect, what they're, they're um, genetic predisposed to. And I use Labradors as an example because they're the most common dog in the United States. German Shepherds are number two, but the Labrador Retriever, Golden Retriever are by far the majority of dog breeds out there. So they're just a great example to use because there's no point using, um, you know, in like, oh, let's say a, Egyptian pharaoh hound because it's such a specific breed that most people, one, probably have never heard of, but two have seen. So that's why I use Labrador Retrievers. But going to the breed standards, they will say these are the positives and the negatives for the breed. Then you have tests that you can do that look, are they predisposed for these genetic markers for, let's say, hip dysplasia? But I say that's only 50% of the story. Because we know, let's take a human example. I have diabetes in my family. Both grandparents had diabetes on both sides. So I know if I'm 300 pounds, eating sugary diet, drinking soft drink all day, not exercising, I have a good chance of developing diabetes. But if I keep myself lean and fit and don't drink soda pop, as they call it here in this country, and eat a balanced meal and there aren't overweight and not eating too many sugary things and just having a healthy lifestyle, I probably won't get diabetes. But I know that I'm predisposed to it, so I've implemented changes in my life to limit the chance of me developing that genetic predisposition to that disease. So that probably answers your question, Michael. I believe 
genetics at 50 percent and what you do at 50 percent because you can have a dog that has no genetic predisposition for hip dysplasia but you go out as a puppy and you overfeed it you run it you do repetitive exercises you do the wrong type of exercises you beat up that hip joint it will develop hip dysplasia later on in life so it's the chicken the egg which causes which um, and that's still the great conundrum that we are doing a lot of research in which is more important genetics or environmental factors the fact that people have this awareness they, when they do get a, a labrador and they get the labrador because the labradors love to retrieve they love to go hunting they love to play they they're, they're an active dog now that they know that they have this issue potentially and they're now got it on their radar so the best way besides diet keeping them thin and fit the next thing is really watch what you're doing with their exercise, right? Watch what you're doing because that really puts a lot of and when to do it because the rule of thumb for puppies is five minutes of exercise per month of age, per day. And that is, and I've got to ex- explain what I mean by that. To go for a walk around the block, um, that is not exercise. Exercise is running the puppy, doing really strenuous things um, that equates to exercise. So yeah. if we're talking about um, just normal exercise, the rule of thumb is five minutes of exercise per month of age for a large breed puppy. Then we need to look at what we're feeding, how much we're feeding. and that, But that comes along with exercise and then supplements. What supplements we need to help them, to help build, give them that raw material so they have healthy, fit, um, active joints, muscles, and ligaments that then help support those joints if they have a problem with, um, say, a genetic predisposition or, let's use the example, hip dysplasia again. When you're talking about five minutes a day per month of age for puppies, what about older dogs? No, there's there's not really a mathematical, because you, you, you exercise them to the point where they show signs of being tired. They lie down. They will tell you pretty well because you now know how to communicate with your older animals. You know what the signs are. Or if they come home and they're sore, you then don't exercise as much the next time. And you you find that happy medium. Okay, I know my, my German Shepherd can work 10 blocks, but my pug can only work six blocks. So we'll go out with the Shepherd first and then we'll come back after four blocks, pick up the pug, and then we all walk together. You learn where your animals are in their fitness, environmental conditions, if it's a hot day outside or a cold day, how much you can push or not push. And that's just through the the love and communication that you develop with your pet over a lifetime with your pet. With the puppies, they're new. We need to do things to help protect them while we're building that communication and that language to read, are they enjoying this? Are they active to be actively able to do this? Or can they not do that? And that's where that five minute comes in, just as a rule of thumb to give you a little benchmark so you don't overdo it with your puppy in the initial stages. With this, when you see that your dog has got this condition potentially and you're taking all the right precautions to make sure that they're healthy and safe in their older age or just as they're growing, because I think in the de- development of their puppyhood, what you're talking about, is there operations that people go through, they can repair these issues that come along? Yes, so there's a couple of things we can do. So back to the genetic portion. We know that um, the puppy comes from a breeder or a breed that has, say, hip dysplasia. We're picking on hip dysplasia, but that's one that can be surgically corrected. We can go in and we can do radiographs while the growth plates are still growing and do radiographs radiographs, one called the pen hip score, and we can look at the hips under force, under a radiograph to see what level of hip dysplasia they have at certain milestones in their development. Then we can say, oh, okay, these are going to be dysplastic hips. We can do surgical procedures on the puppy where we close, we, we go into surgery, we open the hip joint, and we actually close the growth plates, and that changes the angles of the hip. Or we can, I call it, do carpentry, where we actually cut the hip into bone into three parts, and we 
use plates and screws to change the angle. So as the puppy continues to grow, the hips then grow into proper alignment into the ball and socket joint of that hip and give them the best chance of developing normal, healthy hip joints. Um, so there are things we can do surgically. Then on the reverse side, later on in life, we can do surgical procedures like a total hip replacement. So a dog that is over 35 pounds can have a total hip replacement where we replace the ball and socket joint just like in humans. If they're lighter than 35 pounds, we can do what's called a femoral head osteotomy. And we actually go in and we surgically remove the ball from the head of the femur out of the socket. So actually there's no communication between now the femur and the hip joint, but they produce something called an artificial joint that takes place of that grinding and we remove the bone-on-bone contact and they can actually walk well, but this is a procedure that does is done for dogs less than 35 pounds. So there are surgical procedures we can do, Mike. Technology these days is amazing what doctors can do. I, I had a disc replacement in my back this last year, and it's I feel like it's a bionic disc, and I feel so happy to have it. Kirsten, hello, welcome. How are you doing? Hi, I'm doing great. Um, I just have one of my dogs, both of her uh, ACLs have been torn in the past, and I did uh, laser therapy to to repair one of them. Um, so I was just uh, interested in the title of, of this um, just so I could learn a little bit more about it. Did you have a particular question or a direct question for Dr. John maybe about your dog's issue? Have did, we lost it? Maybe. Oh, there she no, is. I'm sorry. Oh. I'm actually at a, at a drive through Um, I, you know, I'm just, um, right now we're, I give her, a, 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 su- a joint supplement and she takes Prevacoc and that seems to be taking care of it, um, for the most part. But, um, if there was, if there's anything else that I could do that would benefit her, I would sure be interested in that. Beautiful. Dr. John, do you have any thoughts? Yes. So we know that with cranial cruciate ligament disease, so in, uh, uh, I I say knees or stifles, because some people, when I mention stifles, people don't know what I'm talking about. So the knees of your dog, the hind limb, their knees, they have what's called the cranial cruciate ligament, the CCL. We call it an ACL in our knees. And we know in dogs that the majority of dogs, if they rupture one CCL ligament, they will rupture 60 to 80% chance of rupturing the other CCL ligament within a six to nine month time frame. And that's probably sounding what's happened to your beloved pet. But we know that when we talk about degenerative joint disease, that the ligaments in the knee are very poor blood supply. And so we're now seeing that there's a genetic component of that, how the bones are lined up and the shear force that's put on that ligament but also negative changes happen in this synovial fluid environment of the joint that become toxic. So we're now getting degeneration. We'll call it arthritis is starting in the joint. It's taking a lovely, basic, healthy environment and turning it toxic. And that toxins then attack the ligament and start to fray the ligament and make the ligament weaker. And that's what eventually causes the tearing of the CCL ligament. Um, we can fix it by surgically or non-surgically through a multimodal um, medical management system for the cranial cruciate ligament. But it comes back to what can you do now? And so it sounds like you're on a joint supplement. On a Prevacoc, that's a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. We have a program actually in my cranial cruciate ligament program. I give a step-by-step 12-week pharmaceutical nutraceutical course of introducing about six to nine different pharmaceutical drugs and supplements to help build muscle, change that environment in the joint to bring it back to a more healthy environment to slow down that degenerative joint disease because we know once they tear that ligament, now we've got joint laxity. 
the bones moving back and forth. It's doing things it was never designed to do. It's beating up that cartilage in the joint, so we're now getting damage to that cartilage that will progress the development of degenerative joint disease faster. So bringing on board supplements, doing training, because we know building muscle up around that joint, your soft tissue structures hold your joints in place. We know, and I experienced it myself with COVID, I wasn't able to go out running, do the gym exercise and that that I usually do. My joints started to hurt. I won't say what big birthday is next month on me, but things started to hurt that never hurt before because I had lost the soft tissue muscle around those joints just because being stuck in quarantine. So these are things we need to think about with our pets that are undergoing these types of orthopedic issues. What are the long-term effects and what can we do to slow down the progression of that degenerative joint disease later on in their life? Kirsten, the fact that you're here and you've had this issue with your dogs, does this help you? Yeah, I, uh, I'd sure be interested to learn more about um, uh, I, Dr. John spoke about some another speaking engagement that he might do um, if I heard it right. Um, that I'd, I'd be interested to learn more about any other um, like natural type supplements or something like that that I could do to, to help her along. She's almost 13. Um, in August, she'll be 13. But she's an Australian cattle dog, so I'm hoping she'll, you know, she's got longevity in her line. So I'm hoping she'll live for quite a bit longer. Um, but I just want to keep her as comfortable and healthy as I can. Um, I do do dog training, but I've stayed away from doing much with her because I don't want to strain the 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 two back legs, you know, with a lot of up yeah. and down type of movements and things like that. Well, the, the speaker, the, or what I was talking about, I have a program I launched uh, nine months ago, Canine Rehab On Demand. And this is a program that I've been training vets and rehab professionals for the last five years um, on different orthopedic diseases and issues and then how to explain it to their clients in the consultation rooms and what pharmaceuticals and nutraceuticals they should be prescribing. We then went under COVID-19. And so my students or the veterinarians and rehab professionals around the world couldn't see clients. So I took all that education material and I made that now available to the public. Plus I built a 12-week rehabilitation program that you can do with your pet at home, all the videos, the written instructions. It's like um, the Jane Fonda workout. I don't know, you're probably too young to remember the Jane Fonda workout, um, but it's like that system. And then you do that in conjunction with the 12-week pharmaceutical and nutraceutical plan. Or we have an equipment checklist of pieces of equipment like harness and that that can help your pet recover from surgery after they have a CCL ligament surgery. And so this is an all-round package that we put that I put together to help my clients, to help all my vets, to help their patients and help their clients be able to do rehabilitation with their pets at home. So this is a great program uh, that we do. And so we have, I think we're putting in hip replacement and femoral head osteotomy uh, programs this week. Um, so I'm constantly adding new programs to uh, that platform but go have a look because that we then walk through a 12-week pharmaceutical and nutraceutical plan to help your pet get back on their feet exercises to help build core strength because doing exercise is fantastic but there are certain things you need to do at certain times and being an Aussie shepherd she's a little close to my heart and um, so yeah I, I love those breeds and um, you know, a little advice to the Australian breeds and that actually but um, yeah, but that's a great program that could probably really help you get you some information. But there's some blogs on that site that also talk about supplements as well. Yeah, and I see a lot of people in these rooms, Doctor John, is that people are looking for more of an organic and a holistic approach, and more of maybe just rehab physically versus all these pharmaceuticals. So I see that across the board here in Clubhouse that people are really looking for other alternatives than just going to that pharmaceutical or to the knife, let's say, um, for the first. And it's re- Michael. It's really important. 
because we know that pharmaceutical drugs have side effects. Um, we also know surgical procedures have side effects. So I try and give both sides of the picture in the education. This is what standard pharmaceuticals will do for this disease. This is the surgical intervention. But if you don't want your pet to have surgery or your pet can't have surgery, and that's another big thing, here is a medical management option with nutraceuticals as well. So I give both sides of the coin and people can choose the programs that they want. If their pet's having surgery, they buy the surgical program. If their pet's being treated medically, they buy the medical the, the medically or conservative treat program because I want to give people options because people should have options and some animals aren't good candidates for surgery. So what do you do if they can't have surgery? There needs to be something else. And that's what I've built as well. Yeah, and I think that's so beautiful about your program. So Kirsten, definitely check out his program, Canine Rehab on Demand. It's He's done so much work and he's got such an incredible background in his studies and what he does with animals and works with animals. So check that out, Kirsten. And you know, I'd love to have you just follow up with me too and just let me know how your dog is doing as well because you know, I love bringing people together and so that they can find that there are different options out there. And you know, Dr. John has done really an incredible job with his website and this Canine on Demand program that is just I think it's brilliant and I think everybody should they have a dog that has issues it's such a great place to actually start start with the issue uh, we do have Nikki up here um, one of my favorites here also on Clubhouse Miss Nikki how are you today what's up good good so I had a question for Dr. Jones surrounding because he was mentioning harnesses and I was thinking it made me think about braces so I know that we've had in clinic a couple of dogs that were um very advanced in age. We had like a 16-year-old lab, 15-year-old shepherd that had had um, basically CCL injuries. And they we were looking at alternatives as far as for braces for those dogs, along with, you know, medical management and all that kind of stuff to provide supportive care. And I was wondering, do you have any particular brands of braces or things to look for in a brace for, say, like a CCL injury to a dog? So as an alternative for a dog that maybe isn't a very good surgical candidate, um, because of advanced age or something like that. Uh, Nikki, great question. And yes, uh, bracing is a great option if you're the patient or your the pet isn't a surgical candidate or you don't want to go through surgery. Um, bracing, because all we need to do is stable that joint for six to nine months. I know people go, wow, six to nine months, but stabilizing it for six to nine months, the joint will create scar tissue around it and hold it in place. And we know two years out, the amount of degenerative joint disease in a post-surgical CPLO joint or any type of surgery and a conservative managed movement joint is about the same. So you're getting, it doesn't matter which road you go down, you're getting to the same outcome eventually. When it comes to braces, I love my two companies of choice are Ortho Pets out of Denver, and I've worked very closely with them over the last decade, and Hero Braces, and they're in, uh, and I think they're Hero Dog, and they're out of Kansas. And they're both fantastic custom brace um, manufacturers that have their heart in it. These are custom braces. They take a fiberglass mold of the leg of the patient. They ship that off, and they build a brace around that mold. They make a plaster cast and actually build it so it's custom. Things you've got to watch out for braces, and that was another great question, Nikki, is you need it to be stable. These soft neoprene braces that are out there, they really don't work because you still have that forward thrusting, and what forward thrusting on is the cranial cruciate ligament prevents the tibia thrusting forward and, and pushing the patella forward. And so this brace will hold that in place and stop that and allow the environment it will heal and scar tissue to form. It's like if you break your bone, say you broke your forearm. If you didn't have your forearm in a cast, that bone's never setting because every time you move your arm or bash it or touch it, that, that break is always moving. We put a plaster cast on it just to allow that environment time to heal itself. And that's what we're doing with a custom brace. These neoprene braces, these slip-on sleeves really don't work because there's nothing mechanically that's stopping that forward thrusting motion. Then we've got to have perfect fit and looking to see how the brace fits because 
the patient will be wearing that brace every non-supervised hour or every supervised hour, I say, during the day or when they're walking and you take the brace off at night when the patient's not being supervised. Because I've had dogs in 30 seconds destroy a $1,000 worth of brace um, gnawing at it. But they get used to it and it makes them, and people don't realize this, with a great custom brace, the patient is 99% functional the instant that brace goes on. So they tear, they crane a cruciate ligament. It takes a week to two weeks to build the brace. They are back enjoying their life within a week to two weeks with the brace on, where with surgery, they're out of action at least for six months and not back to 100% for 12 months. So does that answer your question, Nikki? Yeah, it was. So it was the two brands you said were Hero Brace that was Hero in Kansas. What was Kansas. the other one? So they're called Hero Dog, I think, dot .com, and Orthopex. Orthopex. And they're, and they're in Denver. And they're the two best bracing companies that I've dealt with that have great customer service, customer care. Hero Dogs, the actual orthopedist, actually is an amputee himself. So he understands a little bit better what is involved because he can um, commiserate or has some what, empathy for what the pet is going through. And then um, Martin with Ortho Pets is another. He was a human um, orthopedic brace maker for decades. And then he turned to the world. I mean, he does great charity work all over the world. But they're my two go-to uh, custom brace companies. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nikki, for always coming up. I, I love your questions. I know that your passion is for the animals. And so that's, I love that you asked about this because that was one of my questions for you, John. I had a PCL replacement in my knee and I had different braces like Nikki's talking about. And then I had a neoprene brace. Are the neoprenes at all good for the dogs at a certain point? Does it help them at all stabilize their knees or anything like that? Is there anything out there that works? Let's say they are an older dog, they're in golden years, and they just need that extra support, or is there anything without having to go through this whole manufacturing side of the brace fitting them perfectly? Is there anything else out there that would help? Yeah, so there are other companies. Another great company is called KVP. Um, really, I, Nikki, go have a look at the store because I've incorporated the best companies um, that I could find uh, into uh, my store for these types of things. The so KVP is a great brace. It's called the Bolto brace. It comes from Italy. And it's a neoprene slash. They have plastic inserts and riders and ribs on them that uh, allow for the stabilization. But with the question with the stifle CCL ligament, you need that custom brace to prevent that shear force. If we're talking about laxity in the carpet, elbow dysplasia, other things, then the soft neoprene braces then are working because they're not being put under such shear force and such loading that the, your knee or the stifle joint puts on a brace. So yes, Michael, um, KVP is a great company. Uh, what are some other companies off the top of my head? Um, both the Hero Dog, Ortho Pets, bring out other neoprene style braces for different joints but they're more orthopedic that you need that next level but KVP probably is my go-to or one of my go-to and I can't think of the other uh, manufacturer that I have in my store but yeah KVP does a really great more neoprene short-term acute um, or other soft tissue injury braces. And your site for your store why don't you give us a, your site for your store so that people have it so the site is um canine rehab so the word canine rehab on demand.com you don't have to be a member you just at the top of the um, menu you'll see store click on that and this is the best accumulation of products devices services that i have put together over the last five to ten years of manufacturers that are in there for the heart carts, braces, harnesses, supplements. Most of the people in there I have no affiliate with, but the links take you directly to their fulfillment store of the manufacturer. So you're buying directly from these mum and pup manufacturers that do incredible products. So this is probably the best store anywhere on um, the internet that I know that have been vetted. We call them Johnny approved products. But yeah, it's a great resource that a lot of people, even if 
um, you're not a member or you've purchased my program, I tell people just go to the store because this is the best quality products that I find. And as I find new companies with the best products, I bring them onto the store. I'm about to bring on another three or four companies in the next month and incorporate them into the store. Beautiful. So there you have it, Nikki. Be sure to follow. The, go to his website. You'll find all these and probably more resources there that you didn't expect. Kirsten, what did you think? Does that help you? How would, would braces or were the neoprene work for Kirsten's dog? No, they wouldn't because um, it depends which joint. The stifle joint, if it's a torn CCL, you need the uh, for It looks, it's, it's hardware. It's made with fiberglass and plastics, and you need that um, mechanical action against the shear force of the joint to stabilize it, like a plastic cast does for a broken arm. Other joints like your wrist or your carpus, your hock injuries, elbow injuries, um, those types of braces work really well as a neoprene splint type of brace because they don't need the mechanical strength to prevent that forward shear force thrust that a stifle injury needs. You know, and that's what's so beautiful about this platform clubhouse and by me finding you and having you on here, John, I just love it because you just have all this incredible information. And, you know, everybody in the room, I've been working with John in these rooms, you know, discussing different topics for the last couple of months now and his knowledge base and his study and of what he does and how he does it. It's like, it's such a gem that we have him here just describing these different situations that we talk about each week. Kirsten, before you go, or before we move on to the next question that I have for John, do you have any other questions? Does that help you with your dog, with your little lady? Um, yeah, I, I'm going to look up the website. And um, on the website, uh, you were mentioning something about some exercises. Um, and I think that's what I was referring to earlier. I thought you meant a different speaking engagement. But um, it, so on your website, is there exercises that I can do with her to help her strengthen those? Or, or, or is it too far gone to um, strengthen those at this point? Oh no, you're never too far gone. And I, my, I should have my, it should flash up in lights up in the sky. A little bit of something's better than a whole lot of nothing. And it's never too late to help our beloved pet companions. When you go onto the website, you'll see all the different categories of programs that I have. So I have a dedicated CCL program, surgical and non-surgical. And in that, it goes through a 12 week program where I give four to six exercises every two weeks in two-week blocks that build on the exercises of two weeks before to bring back range of motion, build muscle mass, build flexibility in the joint. So those exercises are really great um, just to start getting back, building the confidence to use the leg because it takes 12 months before they'll get back to normal function and um, and so we want to be doing things all along that all along those twelve months to help build. But no, the exercises are really designed to help get them back on their feet. Okay, great, thank you. Um, she's well past twelve months. One of them is um, from six years ago. That that's the original one I did laser therapy on, um, and then there was another one just a couple of years ago. Um, uh, the second leg so it was actually quite a quite a long ways in between the two um, but I'm sure uh, from what you're saying if, if I can get her doing some exercises now um, it should be able to help both of those and you may want to then look at the osteoarthritis program so I have a, uh, a whole program that just talks about osteoarthritis and what to do to mitigate it in exercises. And that program may then, because she's now multi-years out from the CCL surgery, that may be the better program. So you're educating yourself about osteoarthritis, degenerative joint disease, and how to prevent it, slow it down, and then exercises and strategies to help slow down the development of it in their later years. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. That's going to be really helpful for me. Great. Yeah, thank you for being here and asking your question because being able to help your little girl is like so important. And so, Dr. John, when we're talking about these programs, and one of the things I love that we talk about, and I always like to bring this back up because I think it's so important, is the fact that it's really important for you to warm up your dog and cool down your dog. And I think especially if they're injured or they have these injury 
a lot of people maybe don't do that. Like they don't do it just with their everyday dog for their exercises. So can you just touch on that really quick, how important it is to warm your dog up? It's really important. People don't, as you said, Michael, don't realize it. But with degenerative joint disease or osteoarthritis, it really is important to warm them up because we know osteoarthritis is a pain that hurts when you first get moving. As you think of the joint like an engine, it gets warmed up. That oil is moved through your cylinders. It starts to warm up. The engine starts to purr and move and and perform properly. The same with osteoarthritic joints. They hurt, they're cranky, they're angry when they're not used. So multiple short walks a day is a lot better than one big walk a day for our older pets. Um, taking them for a morning, lunchtime, afternoon walk, multiple little walks around. Instead of doing three blocks, you do one block three times a day. That is a lot better and gentler on the joints, but also helps lubricate, and that's another saying, motion is lotion. Doing things slowly, doing things, warming up, cooling them down, checking the joint for pain, working out, was that block too much, or can I do a block and a half or two blocks tomorrow? And gauging where their comfort level is, is really important. That's where the trick of the warm-up and the cool-down comes in. You're gauging, you're doing things with your beloved pet companion, so you're seeing their comfort level, their enjoyment level. But yeah, the warm-up is important because we've got to get that joint moving. One of the common clinical signs we see is they're stiff to get up. They groan, they ache. Oh, no, sorry, that's just me. Um, (laughs) But that's your pet. And once you start moving, um, that works out. The aches and pains work out and then you feel good. And that's why it, warming up is so important, especially for these pets that are suffering from degenerative joint disease. Yeah. I, when you first brought that to my attention, I was surprised to hear what your findings were with how many people actually do warm up their dogs and don't warm up their dogs or even cool down their dogs. I think it's, you know, it was quite startling to hear those numbers and just see that. And it's just, it makes sense because a lot of people don't know that they should be doing that or they don't think that they should be doing that. But just like us, if we take, you know, from when I work out, I go for a warm up for our first 15 minutes just to get my body because it's older. It's, I've got an older body at this point in time in life. And so it does take a little bit longer for me to get into the gym. And just like you, Dr. John, this last year, I did miss the gym and it has been a little hard to get back into it. Uh, Kirsten, I'm so happy that you came up and I hope you found some in, some valuable information here from Dr. John. He's got this incredible website that I think you're going to find so helpful for you and your little lady. I have a product called Healthy Positive Labs. We do holistic, organic formulas for dogs and their issues. And one of them we have is it's called ouchy and it's for pain and, and uh, you want the essentials plus and it has the hemp oil in it as well this the broad spectrum which is really good for the dogs and especially in their golden years so you may want to take a look at that too that may help you out with you know when she does have a difficult day or a hard day when she's a little extra sore you want something organic and holistic to give it to her you can find that on our website and that might be able to help you with those holistic side of you know keeping her healthy and happy um dr john so we've kind of gone through this this whole thing with like the hows, the what, the co- what causes it, you know, what do you want to give and, you know, all these different treatments. What else are we missing that we haven't discussed today? I think the only, we've talked about weight, we've talked about nutrition. Oh, nutrition is a big thing, um, feeding them a great quality diet um, and keeping them lean and we've talked about that. Really over-exercise is another big thing because, Unless they're an elite athlete, and when I mean elite athlete, agility, they're doing activities like humans, marathon runners and that, they spend a lot of time training. Then we have what I call the backyard heroes, and that's the majority of pets out there. They lay in the backyard Monday to Friday, they get a walk around the block for half an hour to an hour, they're lucky at night, and then the weekend, we go out and it's we're going to conquer the world and we go for the 20-mile ride or... On our push bike, or sorry, yeah, push bike. Like, what is a bicycle <laughs> in this country? I've got to remember people go, What's a push bike? Yeah, I was you like, go going for the 20 mile ride, and your companion's there behind you, tongue hanging out in the dark, trying to keep up. That's overdoing it. Um, that's where we get the when it's like if we were supposed to run 20 miles behind our dog riding on a bicycle, we would be tired and sore that night. And that's the analogy I use. And people go, oh, well, that really makes sense. Um, But we never think about that, that they're not fit. 
um, and they're following us and doing these warrior activities on the weekend that we do. But that's where, especially in puppies, we can do a lot of damage to the developing bone, to developing cartilage that then predispose them to um, OCD lesions, FAC lesions, FCP lesions. These are all abbreviations um, for the shoulder and the elbow or hip dysplasia and that. And so later on in life, you get the reverse. You get that joint gets overloaded. They don't have the physical fitness. We know that if we get on and do a really big workout at the gym, we hurt the next day. They hurt the next day too. And so just having sympathy for the pets, so really that overuse, going to the park, throwing that tennis ball 100 times, really not might not be the best. Doing it 50 times and then going for a walk around the box is a lot better. So exercise from day one with your pup is really important that you actually schedule it and you understand what you're doing with it so that you set your yeah. dog up to win. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, I hear and it's that. all about setting them up for their, to win. And yeah. you use that term all the time and it's really – setting their whole life up so they win. So in their golden years, they can do those things that they love to do. And they're, and we're just protecting those joints for as long as possible. As we know they will get degenerative joint disease. If they have any type of orthopedic issues, it's just slowing down the days of the pipe, you know, the day you have to pay the piper. As a human, I totally understand that because I've had a PCL replacement. I've had a disc replacement in my back, which was a pretty intensive surgery. But, you know, one of the things, you know, I'll share this, Dr. John was like, one of the things that was like the side effect of my surgery in my back, which they didn't explain to me. And I don't know if this happens with dogs. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on this is, is that my, my disc in my back was was gone. It was bone to bone. And so when they put in the artificial disc and the, the bionic little disc that they put in there to replace it, my back grew a half inch within minutes, an hour. The moment that that disc was in there, my back grew and all my muscles on the side where the disc was, they spasmed out because they were, yeah. they were an inch, they were a half inch taller. Um, does that happen with animals when you do surgery with animals? Like, is there side effects like this that are just natural side effects? Yes, and we're all the same. So um, when you're thinking you're doing surgery and you're lengthening anything, we know that muscles contract. So with your back, as your displaces, spaces collapse, you're getting shorter. Your muscles adapt. They hold on stronger to, sub, to create stability in that spinal joint. And so they're a lot stronger around that site of inflammation and the site of surgery. Once you put in the artificial spacer, you grow all those muscles need to then lengthen again and something has to tell them, oh, we don't need to spasm and hold that joint to protect that spinal cord. We now can let go. And that takes a while. And that's the same with our pets. And that's why we call it compensatory soft tissue disease. We know that they're going to hurt elsewhere in the body. So I treat the whole animal, not just the joint that's injured. So we know that dogs have put, 40% of their weight on the forelimb, 60, or 60% of the weight on the forelimb, 40% on the hind, we have an issue to the front right shoulder. They're shifting their weight to the front left sh shoulder limb and shifting their weight back. So we're now overloading other muscle systems to help support while you limp along. Um, same thing if you have a pebble in your shoe, you shift your weight to the other side and you're overloading those muscles and you become tired and sore. Same thing, example, with your back. So, yes, they also suffer soft tissue compensatory issues. Yeah, I wish I would have. I wish I would have known before because I would have like stretched my back out and done a little more yoga before because it was it was something that hung on for a while that they the muscle had to finally get relaxed and like you said, I think it was in a protection mode of like really being tense around that injury and holding the bones closer together and then once it was like released they're like going wait wait, wait we're here to protect you and then, um is there anything else we're getting close to the top of the hour here is there anything else that you'd like to discuss conversation that we're having. I think it's or setting up your puppy or your mature dog or your golden years pet for to win in life. And by being here, listening to this, educating yourselves, I'm humbled that you're here listening to me rabbit on because I'm passionate about this. Michael knows I'm passionate about this, but you're here learning. And a little bit of information goes a long way. So once again, my catchphrase is a little bit of something's better than a whole lot of nothing. And just 
start implementing things slowly into your regime, change, adding a supplement or two, doing your daily activities or exercises a little differently, thinking about longevity, not the short-term implications because we're short-term society, instant gratification. But if I'm doing this type of activity, am I taking away some quality years at the end of that for my pet? So it's about just education. And I want to thank everyone who's here because you're here learning, trying to educate yourself so you have a better relationship with your family member. And that's what's so beautiful is people have, what I found with Clubhouse, it's been such an educational tool for everybody. And by having people like you, Dr. John, with your passion, you have this incredible passion to take care of dogs and help them in this whole arena. And I'm so happy that you're here. And it's rehab on demand. It's, I think, you know, your philosophy with it, the way you approached it, And the way the application works is just brilliant. So um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and close the room. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you for Dr. John for being here. And um, come back next week. We'll be breaking down some other part of your dog's body. And maybe there's something there that's going to help you with your dog or another dog. So with that, everybody, thank you once again for being here. We are in My Dog Has Osteoarthritis. We really kind of learned what that was today, and hopefully we brought some light to everybody. So thank you, and everybody have a wonderful day, evening, wherever you are in the world. And I enjoy seeing you guys here. Thanks.